Well, would you pray with me this morning? Father, I pray that as we prepare now to open up your word, God, I pray that you would help us to do just like this song says, that you would help us to find our satisfaction uh, in you alone. God, that you would be our treasure and that, God, nothing else will satisfy, nothing else will do. We will never be content until we rest in you. God, I pray that as we uh, prepare to, to hear your word, to look at your word, to study your word, that you would give us the eyes to see, see through it Christ, the one that it points us to, that you would help us to, to hear what it is you have to say to us this morning through this passage about Christ and what he's done for us. And God, that you would give us hearts that not only would receive it, but that would be transformed by this message in that it would change the way that we live that it would not just change the way that we live for our own benefit, but that, God, you would also change the way that we live for the benefit of those you have placed in our lives for us to help. God, we ask all these, these things in the name of your precious Son, Jesus. Amen. Well, it's always so good to see you all uh, this morning. Uh, if we have not had the chance to meet yet, my name is John. I get to serve as one of the pastors here at Grace Journey. Uh, and if you're a guest with us this morning, uh, we want to again say to you, welcome. Uh, we are absolutely thrilled that you are here today uh, and that you brave the unknown in walking into a room like this filled with a people like us. Uh, we are not perfect people. Uh, nobody but Jesus ever was and ever or ever will be. Uh, but we are a people who love Jesus, the one who came to save us. And we are a people who love those like us that he came to save. And so we are just really glad that you're here. Uh, maybe you found us uh, online. Maybe you found us by driving by. Uh, maybe you found us because somebody invited you here this morning. Uh, but regardless, we want you to know that we are just sincerely thankful that you came here this morning and that, you give an, that you're giving us the opportunity to get to know you. Uh, our hope is that by the time that you leave, you will walk out of this place, you will walk out of these doors, knowing not just how much we care about you and how much God cares about you, but also about how much we would love to walk alongside you on your journey to learn more about Christ and the grace that we find through him. So as a church, we make it our rhythm to regularly walk through whole books of the Bible. And we believe that the Bible is not just another book among many. It's not just another book on the shelf. Instead, we believe that it is the uniquely inspired, inerrant, and authoritative Word of God. And so when we open up our Bibles, when we hear it read, when we read it ourselves, what's going on is we're actually hearing God speak to us. He is speaking to us. And this should amaze us. It should shock us that God who created the universe not only created us, but also came to save us. And he wants us to know how and why he did this so that we can receive this great gift of salvation through faith in Christ. So if you've been with us at any point uh, since Christmas, uh, you'll know that we've been in a series through Luke's Gospel. And a study of this book could take quite easily years, right? And we, we all know this from week to week. Uh, some churches have done just this. They've taken years to go through this book, and they have been richly blessed by doing so. But that is not the way that we've decided to work our way through this book. Uh, instead, what we've done is we've decided to let Luke, like a tour guide, lead us through the life of Christ. Not uh, in a, such a way that he gives us uh, an in-depth look at every part, uh, but more so in a way that he gives us an overview. Uh, and so rather than studying each part of Luke's gospel with a microscope in hand, looking at each and every detail, instead what we want to do is we want to step back. We want to look at each of the parts and we want to see how when viewed together they paint a big picture of who Christ is, what he came to do, and what that means for people like us. But in order to see that big picture, and in order to cover the whole book between Christmas and Easter, which has been our goal, uh, what we have to do each week is we have to look at fairly large sections. Uh, some weeks we cover a lot, and then other weeks we cover a lot. And so you all know that. People, if you're new with us, you're like, what are they laughing about? Well, hang in there. So uh, believe it or not, it is already March. Uh, it's March the 1st. It's crazy to believe. And Easter Sunday is only six weeks away. And so we have come a long way through Luke's gospel, especially over the last month and a little bit before that when Pastor Bill preached the first very long passage. Uh, 
uh, but we still got a lot of ground to cover. Uh, so what I want to do is I want to invite you to strap on your hiking boots, so to speak. I want you to tie tightly the laces uh, as we prepare to traverse this wonderful pro- uh, portion of God's Word this morning. And so if you have a Bible, let me go ahead and invite you to open it uh, with me to chapters 15 and 16 of Luke's Gospel. And if you're new with us, you heard me right, chapters 15 and 16. Uh, and if you don't have a Bible, there should be one available to you underneath the seat in front of you. Uh, and if you're using one of those copies, we'll be starting on page number 874. And, and then also, too, if you don't have a Bible, uh, if you don't have one at home, or you don't have one laying in your car, you don't have one at all, uh, we would love for you to take one of those copies home with you today uh, and to read it regularly. So once you find your way to Luke chapter 15, and if you're able to do so, would you please stand with me in honor of the reading of God's Word this morning? Hear the word of the Lord as found in the gospel according to Luke, starting in the first verse of chapter 15 and then continuing on to the last verse of chapter 16. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost? until he finds it. And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp? And sweep the house, and seek diligently until she finds it. And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so, I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And he said, There was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into his field to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate. And no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him. And felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf, because he he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, Look, These many years I have served you, and I never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead 
and is alive. He was lost and is found. He also said to his disciples, There was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was wasting his possessions. And he called him and said to him, What is this that I hear about you? Turn in the account of your management, for you can no longer be manager. And the manager said to himself, What shall I do since my master is taking the management away from me? I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do, so that when I am removed from management, people may receive me into their houses. So, summoning his master's debtors one by one, he said to the first, How much do you owe my master? He said, A hundred measures of oil. He said to him, Take your bill and sit down quickly and write fifty. Then he said to another, And how much do you owe? He said, A hundred measures of wheat. He said to him, Take your bill and write eighty. The master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves uh, by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. One who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. The Pharisees, who were lovers of the money, heard all these things, and they ridiculed him. And he said to them, You are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. The law and the prophets were until John. Since then, the good news of the kingdom of God is preached, and everyone forces his way into it. But it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one dot of the law to become void. Everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. And he who marries a woman divorced from her husband commits adultery. There is a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things and Lazarus in like manner bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in anguish. Besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able and none may cross from there to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham. But if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. This is God's word. You may be seated. If you're thinking this is one of those a lot weeks, this is actually not not too bad considering uh, what we've looked at in the past. Uh, But what we find here in this passage, in these two chapters, is a collection of five parables. The first three are in chapter 15, and the last two are in chapter 16. The third parable is one of the most beloved parables in the entire Bible. The fourth is one of the most baffling or most easily misunderstood parables, especially in Luke's gospel. So here we have, back to back against each other, one parable that has been the source of great comfort for people throughout the ages, 
and yet another that has been the source of great confusion. And so it should make for an interesting time this morning. In his account of Jesus' life and teachings, Luke records roughly 25 of the Lord's parables. And in these two chapters alone, we find five of them, three of which Luke is the only one to have recorded. None of the other gospel writers tell us about three of these. So before we begin our trek through these parables, through this passage, I think it's important for us to take a brief moment and just ask the question, what exactly is a parable? What is it supposed to do? What's its purpose? So if you were sitting there and you're wondering that very, that very question, let me just say to you, that is a great question. Thank you for asking it mentally so that I can answer it. I appreciate that. And so here's the short answer. A, a parable is typically a short story designed to communicate a deep yet simple spiritual truth. And the way that it does this is by taking one thing, something that is known and familiar to people, and using that thing to point to another thing, something that is unfamiliar, something that is unknown. Now, we saw this illustrated last week in verses 18 through 21 of chapter 13, when we find Jesus saying these words. He says, what is the kingdom of God like? And to what shall I compare it? It is like a grain of mustard seed. That may sound familiar if you were last week. And then he also goes on to say in those verses, to what shall I compare the kingdom of God? It is like leaven. Now, parables teach us deep spiritual truth in understandable ways. And they do this primarily on two levels. On one level, parables teach us about God, who He is, what He has done, and what He expects of us. And then on the other level, parables teach us a lot about ourselves, about who we are, what we've done, and how we relate to God. So, to state it differently, parables teach us about the king as well as about life in the kingdom. So, parables are treasure troves of rich theological truth. It doesn't take a PhD to understand them, but it does take an attentive ear and a receptive heart to receive them and to live in light of the truths that they communicate. So as we walk our way through this passage this morning, we're going to do so in two parts. Uh, first, we're going to look simply at chapter 15. And then secondly, natu quite naturally, we're going to look at chapter 16. And so as we look at the parables found in these chapters, we're going to do so primarily by looking at what they teach us about God and secondarily uh, looking at what they teach us about ourselves. And so we're going to start by looking at chapter 15. And this is one of the best known and, and, mo and best loved chapters in the entire Bible. Chances are if you're one of those people that highlights your Bible, a lot of this, if not all of this, is probably highlighted. And it's understandably popular. It's understandably so near and dear to so many people because it is like a sponge thoroughly soaked in gospel truth. You cannot pick it up without the gospel just spilling out all over the place. And in this chapter, what we see is the glorious truth that God is gracious toward the repentant. And we see this truth illustrated vividly in three powerful parables. But before we get into them, let's go ahead and set the stage for all of these parables and for the chapter as a whole by looking at the first two verses where Luke paints this scene for us. And if you have a Bible, I invite you to look at it with me. He says this in the first two verses. Now the tax collectors and sinners were drawing near to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So here we have two groups. First, we have the tax collectors and the sinners. Tax collectors were not very popular. They were viewed as traitors because they aligned themselves with the Romans. And they were also viewed as thieves because they collected more in taxes than they were supposed to. Sinners is kind of a, a catch-all category for everyone who disobeyed God and who didn't measure up to the law. The first group consisted of the irreligious and unrighteous. They felt like they couldn't be any further from God. They had broken too many of his rules. 
God couldn't possibly love them anymore. They just didn't deserve his love. Next up, we have the Pharisees and the scribes. They were the religious leaders of the day. They believed that slavishly and meticulously following the letter of the law could somehow make them earn God's favor and acceptance. And this second group consisted of the religious and self-righteous. They didn't think that it was possible to be any closer to God. They'd, kept, they'd certainly kept enough of the rules. Of course God loved them. They deserved God's love. But notice what Luke tells us about these two groups and their different reactions to Jesus. The irreligious sinners were drawing near to hear him. They were doing the very thing that Jesus said to do in the, previous, in the, la, in the very last verse of the very last chapter when he said, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. They were doing this. But the religious leaders, in contrast, were grumbling about Jesus. And they were criticizing him for even associating with these sinful people. And so these first two verses of this chapter help us to set the scene for the three parables that follow. And they give us a clue as how to understand their message. So in the first two parables, which we find in verses 1 through 10, we see that God seeks out the repentant. Jesus begins by telling the story about a lost sheep. There was a man who had a hundred sheep, but one of them turned up missing. In response, the man doesn't say, ah, you know, it's just one sheep. I still got 99 left. Ah, who cares? Maybe it'll come back on its own. He doesn't say this. No, instead, he launches a full-on search to find his lost sheep. He leaves the 99 that are safe, and he goes after the one who is in danger. He considers no effort, no trouble, no hardship too great when it comes to finding his lost sheep. And when he finds it, he doesn't punish it. He doesn't doesn't violently drag it back home. Instead, he graciously lifts the exhausted and, and likely terrified sheep. He places it on his own shoulders and he carries it home. He doesn't even complain about having to carry it. He only rejoices that what was lost has now been found. Jesus then, amen, right? Jesus then proceeds to tell, if you thought that was good, it gets better too, so. And Jesus from here, he proceeds to tell a second and a a related story about a lost coin. There was a woman who had 10 coins, but one of them turned up missing. And she spares no effort in trying to find this lost coin. Jesus' emphasis here is on the thoroughness of this woman's search. She lights the lamp and she searches the entire house in order to find this lost coin. And when she finds it, she, like the the, the man in the previous parable, doesn't complain. She doesn't complain about the time, energy, or effort she had to spend in finding it. She only rejoices, again, that what was once lost has now been found. So it doesn't take long to notice a few reoccurring themes in these two parables. And I'll mention three of them very briefly, and I'm going to highlight what they show us about God. When it comes to finding lost sinners, God does three things. First, God takes the initiative. In both parables, something is first lost and then subsequently found. The sheep doesn't help the man find it. The coin certainly doesn't help the woman find it. Now, the Jewish rabbis of Jesus' day, they agreed with him that God would receive and welcome back any who repented of their sin and came back to God. But they had no concept whatsoever of a God who took the initiative to seek out the lost, to go after them, to pursue them. They had no such concept. And this is exactly what Jesus emphasizes in these parables. The focus is in both of them is on the initiative of the one who does the searching. Second, we see that God bears the burden. The man and the woman are the ones who incur the cost involved in finding that which was, which was lost. The woman sweeps the entire house. The man carries the sheep home on his own shoulders. And then third, God celebrates the result. And both of these parables end on this note of celebration. There is a party. Both of them throw a party and they invite others to join in it. 
Now, when it comes to these two parables and the three themes that we've seen, it's important for us to see that this is precisely what God has done when it comes to saving sinners like you and I. He is the one who took the initiative when he came to earth to save a wayward, rebellious, and wicked people. He bore the burden of finding us when he gave his own life as a sacrifice on the cross for sinners. He is the one who took our sin, put it on his own shoulders, and then paid the price for it. And he did this all gladly, celebrating the work of redemption that he had come to accomplish on behalf of sinful people. Just like the man and just like the woman in these parables, he invites us with him to celebrate when even just one lost person comes to faith in Christ and is found. In the first two parables, Jesus emphasizes the divine perspective of what happens in salvation. He is the one who takes the initiative. He is the one who seeks out the repentant. Now, in this third parable, he emphasizes the human perspective of what happens in salvation. God welcomes the repentant home. They repent and come back to the Father. And so Jesus introduces this story by saying that there was a man who had how many sons? Two sons, right? Now, we often refer to this parable as the parable of the prodigal son, singular. But it may be more accurate to consider it like the the parable of the lost sons. Thinking about it this way helps us to see the relationship between this parable and the two that precede it. And it also helps us to see the important truth that there is more than one way to be lost and to be far from the Father. So after he introduces the parable, Jesus begins by focusing on the younger son. And with bright colors, he paints a vivid picture of this young man's descent into sin and away from the father. For starters, this young man demanded that his father give him his inheritance. Now typically, inheritances were not given out until the father passed away. And so in demanding that his father gave, give him his inheritance, now he's pretty much telling his dad, Dad, I wish you were dead. Surprisingly, though, the father grants his son's request. And after getting his portion of his father's inheritance, the younger son takes all that he had and he leaves for a faraway country. Now, when it says that he took everything that he had, this goes to show you that he never intended to return. He had no problem burning the bridge. He never planned to come back. He wanted to be as far away as possible from his father. He was convinced that the secret to a happy and fulfilling life was running away from his father and indulging his every sinful and selfish desire by squandering everything his father had graciously given to him. This is what sin does, is it not? It deceives us into thinking that satisfaction, fulfillment, and pleasure are found not in running to God, but in running away from Him. Sin tricks us into thinking that we know better than God does what will result in a happy life. It's an incredibly seductive, and I would add destructive, lie. And living this way, it did not take long for the younger son to fall onto hard times. He simultaneously ran out of money and ran into a famine. The first was his own fault as a result of his own actions. The second was not, but it certainly did not make matters easier for this young man. None of the friends that that had helped him waste his life in reckless living could or even would help him. In order to survive, he had to get a job which was not exactly the easiest thing to find in an economy such as his. He had to settle for the most humiliating and the most repulsive of jobs, especially for a Jew. His job was going out and feeding the pigs. And this wasn't even the worst part. You think, man, how could it possibly get worse? Well, it does. Not only was he responsible for feeding these pigs, he didn't even have enough to feed himself. Jesus tells us that he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate. In other words, he had sunk to a point so low that he would have been absolutely thrilled to eat the pigs' leftovers. I'm not talking about leftovers that are pig. I'm talking about the pigs' actual leftovers. 
He would have loved to eat them, but there were no such leftovers. The younger son's sin, after promising him so much, had left him worse off than the pigs. Now, this is one of the most vivid pictures we get in all of Scripture about what sin is like and what sin leads us to do. Now, my first job was in retail. And for anybody that knows me now would not be surprised uh, to hear that that first job was in a bookstore. Um, I, I, I did not have as much of a love for books as I did back then as I do now, but regardless, that's the job that I got. And partly the reason why I love books is probably because of that job. But regardless, um, one of the most valuable lessons I learned early on in that job was this. Under promise and over provide. I see some, some people's lips because they've heard that too. Now, if somebody, what this meant is that if somebody wanted to special order a book that we did not currently have in stock, what that meant was that it was best for me to set their expectations low and then to exceed those low expectations. It sounds kind of twisted, but man, hey, it's retail, right? Now, if the system and the computer system told me that it would take uh, a couple days for the book to come in, what I was supposed to do and trained to do was to tell the customer that it would probably take about a week. Now, in my years of working retail, I never once had a customer complain that a book came in earlier than expected. I can, unfortunately, tell you stories about people complaining when a book didn't come in as early as promised, but I can share those stories with you afterwards. And yet, this is precisely what sin does, brothers and sisters. Sin over-promises and under-provides. It flips it on its head. Time and time again, we find this to be the case in our own personal experience. And yet, time and time again, we continue to cave into this temptation and to give into the lie. Sin promises us more than it can ever provide. No one in heaven will ever look back on their earthly life and come to the conclusion, man, I wished I had sinned more. Nobody's going to ever think that. We laugh at that, but brothers and sisters, do we live that way? Now, at some point, every single one of us will discover for ourselves that sin doesn't ultimately satisfy. It may satisfy us for a short period of time, like it did for the younger son when he lived recklessly in a far country. But at some point, we will all come to realize that it leaves us worse off than how it found us. Some of us will come to realize this while there's still time to repent and return home. Others, sadly, will not realize this until it is too late. So if you are here this morning and you've been living far from God, you've been living a life in unrepentant sin, but God in his grace is showing you now, perhaps for the very first time, the emptiness of that kind of life, then I urge you, repent of your sin and return home to the Father. The younger son came to this realization in verse 17, and I can tell you with confidence that he never regretted this decision, and neither will you. At his lowest point, the younger son realized that even the lowliest of his father's servants were treated better than he was in the far country. So he resolved to return home, but he recognized his unworthiness. His heart was broken, not over what he had lost, but over what he had done. He had sinned, and he wasn't making any excuses for his sin. He had come to the point of genuine repentance, and we know this because of his words in verses 18 and 19, where he rehearses to himself what he was going to say to his father. He says, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And then in verse 20, we read about his return home to his father. He doesn't have to go up to the door and knock. He doesn't have to pound and beg the father to come, come to the door. Instead, his father had been eagerly awaiting the return of his lost son. He had been keeping an eye to the hills. And while the son was still a ways off, his father saw him, felt compassion for him, ran out to him, embraced him, and kissed him. Jesus emphasized, his, his emphasis here is on the father's gracious action toward his lost and returning son. But notice this. The son hadn't even yet had the chance to articulate his apology before the father extends forgiveness. 
The father extends forgiveness before his son even has a chance to ask for it. And this is how ready, this is how eager our, fa- our heavenly father stands, ready to receive us who will return to him. Here's how one commentator so beautifully put it, and I love this. It's long, but bear with it. It should be on the screens. It says, So inexplicably wonderful is the love of God that he not merely forgives the repentant sinner, but actually goes halfway to meet him and embraces him in his love and grace. Indeed, as the two preceding parables taught, he seeks and attracts the sinners through the redeeming work of Jesus and through the silent influence of the Holy Ghost, even long before the sinner shows remorse for his sins. He does all this without abandoning his holy righteousness. For Christ Jesus sacrificed himself as an everlasting ransom. And whoever comes to God in his name as a repentant sinner is welcomed by him in perfect love without reproaches, into the heaven, into the fatherly home. The sinner may forget God, but he remains unalterably faithful in his seeking love and grace. What a beautiful picture of God's love. What a beautiful picture of God's grace to those who, who turn from their sin and turn to the Father. In verses 21 through 24, we see that the younger brother doesn't even have a chance to say the last line of his planned apology before his loving father cuts him off and sends for his servants to clothe him in the family garments. And in doing this, the father showed that even though his son rightly recognized that he no longer uh, deserved to be called his son, that is precisely who he is in the eyes of his father. Not because of the son's works, but because of the father's grace. Now, this would have been a powerful message for Jesus' original audience. An audience comprised of tax collectors and sinners. People who knew they were far from God. This is what the, and then and then also too, this is what the three parables are intended to teach us about God. It teaches us about his holiness, and yet also about his willingness to forgive. And then it also teaches us about ourselves, our sinfulness, and our need for the Father's grace. This message was powerful, not just to the tax collectors and sinners, it was also powerful to the other half of Jesus' audience, the Pharisees and the scribes, the people who thought that they were close to God. This is what the last part of the parable shows when Jesus talks about the older brother. Instead of celebrating the return of his lost brother, the older son grumbles and complains about the father's actions. In this way, his resemblance to the Pharisees in verse 2 is uncanny. It is unmistakable. The Pharisees had complained about Jesus welcoming, associating, and eating with sinners. And now we see the older son complaining about his father welcoming home the lost son and throwing a feast and eating with this lost sinner. The point that I don't have time to fully unpack here is that there are two ways to be lost. There are two ways to be far from God. The first is represented by the younger son who lived in unrighteousness. But there is also a second way. And that second way is represented by the older son who lived self-righteously. The one thought he was too bad. The other thought he was too good to need God. It's possible to be far from the father in more than one way. So whatever son you most identify with, the message is the same. Your heavenly father stands ready to forgive you. Like a lost sheep and a lost coin, he seeks you out and he takes the initiative in your salvation. Like the two lost sons, he stands ready to welcome you home, to welcome you back into his loving arms on account of what Christ has done on your behalf. So God is gracious with the repentant. Second, God is generous with the faithful. We see this in chapter 16. Now, we obviously don't have much time to spend here, uh, so I'm going to make it as quick as I can. Uh, I'm going to try to make it quicker than I did the first point. So here we go. At the end of chapter 15, we found, at the, at the end of chapter 15, we found one of the most comforting parables in all of Scripture. But as I said earlier, here at the beginning of chapter 16, we come to the, one of the most confusing but the f- confusion comes about primarily because of, mi- because of a misunderstanding uh, when it comes to verse 8, as we'll see in just a moment. 
In this parable, we see that God commends the faithful for their stewardship. And we see this in verses 1 through 18. Jesus tells a parable about a master who entrusted the oversight of his possessions to a manager. But that manager did not steward the master's resources well. In fact, he wasted much of them. And so the master called on the manager to give an account of his management. And knowing that judgment was coming and that he would soon be unemployed and that he was unable to make a living on his own, the manager takes decisive action. He calls in his master's debtors and one by one, so as to avoid attention, he begins to drastically reduce the amounts that each of them owe. He wasn't so much reducing the debt as he was eliminating the exorbitant amount of interest that was charged on it. This interest would have been the manager's compensation. It would have been his way of, of getting a paycheck. But, but he realized that once he was out of the job, he would not be getting this part of the debt. So he decided to act quickly with what authority he still had in order to secure for himself a future livelihood. Even after he was unemployed, all the people he had helped by reducing their debt would in turn reciprocate that kindness and would help to meet his need. They would help him. He would never lack a place to stay and he would never lack a meal to eat. Now the lesson given in this parable at the, is given at the end of this parable in verses 8 through 13 where in essence Jesus calls his disciples to live as faithful stewards by using worldly wealth in order to secure for themselves the heavenly future. Jesus doesn't commend the manager for his dishonesty. No, instead he commends this manager for his shrewdness. The crooked, this crooked and crafty man knew how to prepare for the future by taking practical steps in the present. If the sons of this world, the ones who live as if there is no eternity, know how to live in such a way as to secure their long-term well-being, how much more should the sons of light the ones who know there is an eternity, live in light of that eternity. It's easy to go about our lives and to fall into the trap of thinking that it's all about getting a bigger and better house, a newer and faster car, a fancier and smarter phone, and many, many countless things like all of these. But we cannot take any of these things with us. The next parable Jesus tells at the end of this chapter is going to make this abundantly clear. But what we can do with what God gives us in this life is to use it all to make an investment in the life to come. Throughout his ministry, Jesus warned regularly about the dangers of money. He never taught that material possession or worldly wealth were inherently evil. But he does warn about having an unhealthy view of them an unhealthy infatuation with them. A servant can only have one master. A person can only have one God. You cannot serve God and money. Either you're going to love God and despise money or you'll, or you'll love money and you'll despise God. Now, this wasn't a very popular message. It wasn't back then. It isn't today either. But Luke tells us in verse 14 that the Pharisees who were among Jesus' listeners he tells us this interesting thing in verse 14. He says that they were lovers of money. And it's no accident that Luke chooses to describe them in this way, especially after what he said in verse 13. As do many people in our own day, the Pharisees viewed the accumulation of wealth, money, and possessions as evidence of God's blessing and favor on a person. They thought, God must be pleased with me. He's given me a ton of stuff. He must like me. But as Christians, we know that this isn't true. All we have to do is look not only at Jesus' teachings, but Jesus' life to see this. He was born in a manger. He lived in poverty. And he died in a borrowed tomb. God couldn't have been any more pleased with Jesus. And yet he was broke. God calls us to live as faithful stewards of the things that he has entrusted to us on this side of eternity. This includes our riches, but, it's, but it also includes our relationships. And this is how verse 18 fits into this chapter. 
at first you kind of wonder, what exactly is this verse about marriage and divorce doing here? It seems really out of place. But when you stop to think about the stewardship that Jesus is calling us to exercise in this passage, it begins to make sense. His point here is not to teach exhaustively about marriage and divorce, but to illustrate another area of our lives where we need to be faithful in our stewardship of what he has given us. And this is why he can transition seamlessly back into the subject of financial stewardship in verses 19 through 31, where we see the final point, that God rewards the faithful. Now, Jesus tells the story about a rich man and a poor man named Lazarus. Now, this is the only parable that Jesus ever gives where he actually names one of the fictional characters. But his name itself is a part of the whole lesson of the parable. His, his name means God has helped. No one else may have helped this man during his life, but God would, and he did. The rich man had spent his entire life in luxury. He had a large house to live in, expensive clothes to wear, and then more than enough food to eat. In contrast, Lazarus had spent his entire life in poverty and need. He had no house of his own, he was laid at the gate of, of the rich man's house. He had no expensive clothes to wear. He was clothed, so to speak, with sores. And he also had no food to eat. He begged for scraps from the rich man's table. The one had everything he wanted. The other didn't even have what he needed. Now, Jesus doesn't criticize the rich man for being rich. But instead, he criticizes him for using his riches to serve only himself. Instead of viewing his wealth as a stewardship given to him by God to be used in meeting the needs of others and for investing in eternity, this rich man spent all that he had. He spent all of God's material blessings on himself. Rather than helping the poor man who begged at his gate, the rich man just ignored him. Eventually, both of these men died. The one went to be with God. The other went to be far from God in a place called Hades, where there was torment, anguish, and pain. The whole parable illustrates an important truth. The discomfort one experiences in this life as a result of following Christ and obeying God will one day lead to an, an eternity where God will comfort us. But on the flip side, the comfort that one experiences in this life as a result of rejecting Christ, disobeying God, and trusting in our earthly riches, this will all one day lead to an eternity of discomfort, anguish, and pain. How we live and what we believe in this life, on this side of eternity, will determine how we live on the other side of eternity. The subsequent verses of this parable show us that the rich man was not punished because he was rich, or even because he failed to be generous with what he had but instead because he had failed to hear, he had failed to believe, and he had failed to respond rightly to God's revelation through Moses, through the prophets, and ultimately through Christ. He had done so. If he had done so, if he had believed in this message, this revelation, he would have used his wealth differently. Brothers and sisters, how we use our riches, how we use our wealth, how we use our money shows where our hearts really are. Similarly, Lazarus was not rewarded because he was poor, but because he, unlike the rich man, believed in God's revelation. He put his hope not in the help of any earthly man, but in the help of God, who he knew would meet his greatest need. We see this hinted at toward the end of the parable, where Jesus makes an allusion to his coming death and resurrection. Here's how one preacher describes it. It's also a long quote, but I've only done two quotes today, so I feel like I'm permitted to do that. Um, here's the last quote, and we're about done. It says this. The rich man's insistence that if someone would return from, de from the dead, his brothers would repent, was a subtle way of excusing himself. He was implicitly arguing that he would have repented if a special messenger from the dead had come to him. He was saying that Moses and the prophets, God's word, was not enough. This is exactly what our culture says today. The Bible is not enough. The resurrection is not enough. We need special signs and wonders. Then 
we will believe. How arrogant we humans are, daring to tell God what he must do if we are to believe. If God would just send ambassadors from the other side, great multitudes would believe. Would they? Jesus' parable shouts a resounding no. Jesus himself came from the other side. And though some believed, many, like the rich man and his brothers, did not believe. Those who have hardened their hearts to God's word refused Jesus even after after he walked out of his own tomb. And it is still the same today. Brothers and sisters, do not miss the point of this passage. Not just in the first part in chapter 15 where we see God is gracious towards those who repent and return to the Father. But also here in the second passage where God is generous with those who in turn are generous. With those who see God as their greatest treasure. Not their treasure as their God. And who live accordingly. And so as we close our time together, we've seen in these five parables two incredible truths. First, God is gracious with those who repent of their sin trust in Christ, and return to the loving arms of their Heavenly Father. There may be some in this room that need to do that today, and I pray that you will, that you will not leave this place before you do so. We also see that God is generous with those who are faithful toward Him. The ones who steward the resources He entrusts to us, the ones who use them to meet the needs of others, and the ones who believe in Christ, the one who rose from the dead. If we do not believe God's word, not even a man returning from the dead will convince us. But if that is convincing, there is hope for us. And so I pray this morning that we would see the one who not only died for our sins, but conquered and put our sins to rest in the grave and rose again to new life. I pray that we would all believe in him this morning. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you so much for this powerful passage. God, these are, these are packed. These are packed with so much so much that is worth just camping out and being here for hours looking at. But God, I pray that this this overview would just challenge us, that it would challenge us to be generous, that it would also comfort us knowing that no, no matter how bad we've messed up, no matter how far we've run away, you always stand ready to welcome us home. And God, I pray that if there are any here this morning that feel like they have, they're just too bad, they're too evil, they're too wicked, to ever be accepted by you this morning, I pray that they would hear clearly this morning the resounding answer of this, of this passage. That there, there is nowhere too far that they could run. There is no sin too great that you cannot forgive. All they have to do is turn from it and turn to you and come home. And I pray that they would do that. For those of us who are here this morning uh, who think that like the Pharisees and the scribes, we're too good, we don't need God. Grace, what's that? We don't need that. By our own effort, we think that we can somehow earn your favor. But God, this is not true. Help us to see that. That even our, on our, our best days are full of sin. God, I pray that even, even our righteous works are filled with selfish motives. And that, God, we can never satisfy you. We, we can never obey you. We can never, never do enough to counteract the wrongs that we have done. God, we need a Savior. And, and in your grace, that is precisely what you've provided in Christ when he came to take our sin, both our unrighteousness as well as our self-righteousness. And like the first man in the first parable, he took it all upon himself, put it on his own shoulders, and ultimately took it to the cross where he died for it. God, I pray that we would see that gracious work this morning and that we would live in light of it. We ask this all in Christ's wonderful name.